Um, recently, the King family um, got a chance, as we do every once in a while, uh, go grab some breakfast together. Um, we, we had to do breakfast because uh, I have four teenagers, and we're in that, that, that time where it's hard to get everyone together. Uh, they have school, they have jobs, they have friends, and, um, and though they, they all love family and they got other, other growing priorities at this point in life, which is completely understandable. Uh, so the one time they're usually free is like a Saturday morning. Interesting, teenagers don't plan anything for Saturday morning. And so uh, when Dad uh, said, hey, I'll pay for a really good breakfast, they're all, they all kind of said, yeah, we'll get up for that. And uh, we went out and, and, uh, and had breakfast. Um, and it was a great family time, but I, I also had an ulterior motive um, because with this stage of life, not only comes busyness, um, and not only comes a, a, a focus on all those things, but also what's natural, you might remember back to this time for yourself, it was true for me too, is, is um, as you're looking at all those things, sometimes you forget about family. You forget that you're part of a family, and you begin to kind of take it for granted um, that, that the family just is there so that I can take care of all this stuff so I can focus on my stuff. And so we kind of had this uh, meaning that uh, a healthy family is one where folks are, are supported and they are loved and taken just as they are unconditionally. But also in a healthy family, everyone contributes. A healthy family is one where everyone contributes to the betterment of the family. And I just, I challenge them to just, to remember that and to think through, okay, Given you know, where they are in life, and, and we talked about everyone contributes different depending on where you are. You know, when you were five years old, you contribute different than when you're 15, which you contribute different when you're 25, and so on and so on and such forth. And so I was like, where, what do you bring? What, what, how do you contribute to family? And I, just, and I just challenged them to think about that. Now, practically speaking, um, they tell us that if, for every child you have, it costs between, if you haven't had kids yet, you may not want to listen to this, <laughs> somewhere between 175000 to 375000 depending on what economic place you're in, just to get them to before college. That doesn't include college. The average cost is about $233,000 per child. And worth it all. And worth it all. <laughs> yeah, I'm not saying that. But I, I will say that, that that is different than any time in human history. The last 100 years is different than any time in human history. Because in most of human history, and by the way, this is true a lot of places around the world now where they're still very agricultural based, um, actually having a child raised your income. Now, in the beginning, it didn't so much. But, but what happened is you had another pair of hands and feet uh, to work with whatever it is that the family did. Whatever the family business uh, was, uh, you had somebody else to kind of help with that work. And so, you know, if you could have so many chickens, you had a kid when they were old enough, five, six, seven years old, we could have more chickens. They could take care of them. And so on and such forth. The, it it kind of reversed. And you, you see that a little bit, actually, in the difference between first world kids and third world kids, if you would, teenagers, there's a difference because they're raised with a certain amount of responsibility. They're raised with, with the fact that they need to contribute to the family. Even in the first world, you'll, you'll see the difference between some, some cultures um, that come from different cultures that come that, that their kids are kind of required to contribute to the family. And psychologists tell us that contributing is actually strongly linked to fulfillment. If you are contributing to, whether it be the family, whether it be a, a business, a relationship, there is a higher level of fulfillment if you feel that you are contributing. You may remember that uh, sometime back, uh, Corey talked to us about five uh, central things that every person needs, and one of them is significance. And believe it or not, significance is linked to being a contributor. 
When you're contributing, you feel more significant. And you feel part of something greater than yourself. It means more. I remember one time um, we were kind of wondering about our kids and eating lunch, especially our oldest daughter. She was in the first grade, I believe, somewhere kindergarten, first grade, and and um, wasn't too sure. But one day, Lynn happened to be at the school, and um, uh, she was helping out there and looked in the trash can, and sure enough, my daughter's lunch was in the trash can. And so she had a conversation with her, and of course, she initially denied it until, you know, mom said, well, it's right there. And then she admitted that... Uh, she was throwing away her lunch, and so uh, that week, she got her allowance, but she had to take her allowance and go out and buy bread and meat and the things that she was going to eat for lunch, and then um, Lynn kind of helped her. My wife kind of helped her begin to make her lunches, and the very first time she was making her lunch, she was like, I don't like this, and her mom said, well, why? She says, because... <laughs> If I throw this away, this is my money. You know, that's the point. When she was contributing, she had some, she had, she was part of the family. She was, she had, if you would, skin in the game is what they said, and it made a difference. It made a difference. And we don't simply do that because we need our kids' kids' help. To a certain degree, we do. But, but we largely try to do that because we think it's good for them. We think it's really healthy for them to be contributors and not just uh, always kind of getting. Though, of course, because of the different stages, we give more than they do, and that's appropriately. That's what parents are for. Well, today we're going to talk about the importance of contributing, but it's with it here in the church. And Paul uh, writes a letter um, I had a friend that did a series on this letter, one, uh, on this uh, book, the Corinth, uh, Corinthians, and uh, the subtitle was uh, The Church of Corinth, a Jacked Up Church. Um, and really, if there's any church that you want to model after, the Corinth church is not the one you would choose. Um, Paul writes, and there's just a lot of stuff. Interesting enough, and we've talked about this before, the, uh, the city of Corinth resembles a lot the Bay Area. It was a central location. Uh, uh, folks from all kinds of different cultures were there. Everything under the sun was uh, um, available. It was, it was, in terms of those who followed the God of gods, it was probably one of the least unchurched, if you would, or at that time, untempled uh, places in the Roman Empire. Um, and it was here, though, that the gospel, the good news of Jesus had taken hold, and um, but it was a challenge. Uh, as a matter of fact, in, in chapter 3, Paul says to them, you know, that he can't talk to them as mature people. He must talk to them as infants, as babies in Christ. And, and there's a lot of infighting in this church. There's a, a lot of, if you would, posturing um, that, that what I do is better than what you do. Uh, in chapter th uh, 3, he addresses the fact that they're fighting over leaders. Basically, my preacher is better than your preacher. Is what they're fighting over. And then in 12, he, he addresses another issue. Again, the passage will come up on the, on the screen. We're going out of the English Standard Version again this week. It says, Now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be uninformed. All right? And what he's basically saying here is, listen, there's some, there's some things concerning the Holy Spirit. Now, the word gifts right there, uh, actually, this whole chapter will talk about gifts, um, but it's actually not in this first uh, verse. They, they add that to just kind of help you contextually. It's, it's really just saying, concerning things concerning the Spirit, the Spirit of God, um, I don't want you to be uninformed. Translation, you're a little uninformed <laughs> in how you're treating the Holy Spirit. And specifically, he's going to talk about um, gifts, which is a Greek word, um, charismata. You know, we get the word charismatic from it to be, or charisma from it. By the way, it's the same root word, charis, as grace. I want you to think about that. 
It's the same root word as grace. So in Romans 6, 23, for it says, for the wages, the consequences of missing the mark, sin, is death. But the gift, the charisma, the charisma of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The, the grace of God is eternal life. It's the same idea. What he's, what he's saying is, is I don't want you um, to kind of continue as you are. Let's, let's clear things up. Now, I just want to tell you up front, um, as, as we look at this chapter, I want to, you want to understand the big picture before we get into the details. And the big picture is this. Spiritual gifts, the, the graces that come from the Holy Spirit are, say, abilities given by the Holy Spirit to every follower of Jesus that are, uh, that are to be used to minister to the needs of the body of believers, which is the church. When we talk about body of believers, the, the Bible often uses, talks about the church as an illustration of the body. And, and in, in a body, you have hands, and you have feet, and you have a heart, and you have all kinds of different parts, but they make up one body. And, and, that, and the Bible says over and over, that's the way the church is. We, have different, we do different things, but it makes up one body, it makes up one church. And so he, he wants to kind of clarify some issues in this regard. And so he goes on, starting in verse 2. He says that you know uh, when you were pagans, in other words, you weren't following Christ. You're following your own way. You were led astray to mute idols, however you were led, different ways. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking in the Spirit of God ever says Jesus is accursed, and no one can say Jesus is Lord except in the Holy Spirit. Now, this probably is not um, directly, because we happen to know that a lot of people can say Jesus is Lord, and they're really not following Jesus at all. They kind of have their own agenda. But the idea here is kind of twofold. One way, it's a way of testing the spirits, because there are evil spirits that sometimes speak but the one thing it seems to suggest is that an evil spirit will not admit that Jesus, Jesus being a, a lot of things, fine, but Jesus being Lord, that was the reason that they rebelled. They didn't want God to be Lord. And that will not be a confession of faith that an evil spirit would make. But the other thing is, I think, uh, more appropriately, is just the concentration that, listen, there are different peoples that have a different approach to our Savior and God, and just in terms of their expression, right? I mean, some of you have been to churches where the hands are held high and, they're, and they wave a lot, right? Some of you have been in churches that they don't stand. They just sit still, right? And they sing, they, every song is a song that, I mean, it's only good if it's been written over 100 years ago, right? Um, and there's all kinds of different ways to do this thing, right? But what he's saying is, is, that if you look at someone's life and they have made the Messiah, they have made Jesus, the, the one who gave his life, who left the throne of heaven, gave his life for us. They've made him the center of their life. That's the Holy Spirit. That's, you, see, what he's making distinguishing isn't a gift, because that's a lot of times we wanna, what we want to do. If someone... Preaches really well. And I see this all the time. Right? There, you have a really dynamic speaker. Well, obviously, he must be of God. Why? Because he makes me feel good when he speaks. The... Or, you know, somebody did something amazing. I got this story about so-and-so, and they, and they were able to, you know, somebody was really sick, and then also they weren't sick. They, they must be. In... No. Although all those things are, are faked and, and what, he's, what, he's, what, he's saying, what he's saying here is the central issue is did they take themselves off the throne of their lives and they say Jesus needs to be the throne of my, of my life. So no matter what they say or wonderful things that they seem to do, no matter how uh, charismatic they are or in other words attractive, don't fall for that. On the other hand, if they're very different from you, but they put Jesus as the Lord of their life. Don't, that's the Holy Spirit. That's God's Spirit in them. Be careful speaking against that. 
See, the, the immature person, the immature person um, evaluates others outwardly and by the things that, that they think are important. And what, in essence, what he is saying here is that those who have the Holy Spirit share, we share the same confession, the confession that Jesus is Lord. And I would just point out that the confession is not Jesus is a good man. It's not Jesus is a prophet of old. It's not Jesus is a teacher or Jesus is a, even a man of love and forgiveness. All those things, by the way, are true. But that's not the central confession. The central confession is that he is Lord. That's a sign that the Holy Spirit's working in someone's life, that they have an authentic uh, message, is that Jesus is the center and Jesus has the authority, not them. He goes on to say in, um, in verse 4, Now there are a variety of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are a variety of service, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it's the same God who empowers them all in everyone. Paul deliberately here kind of um, takes the, if you would, the, the graces, the different ways that you can look at gifts, if you would, and he kind of describes them in three different words, um, but he uses them kind of as synonyms, as the same. And the first thing he says, right, is that there's all kinds of different gifts. There's all kinds of different uh, graces that people do different things, but, but don't, don't be fooled. There's only one God who allows them to do that, whatever that gift may be. We're going to find out later. For instance, teaching is a gift. Let's all hope I have that gift or we're in trouble. Uh, we're going to find out uh, service is a gift. Just helping people is, is a gift. Healing people is a gift. And what he's saying is, is that if somebody teaches, they don't have any more holy, of the Holy Spirit than someone who serves. And if someone heals, they don't have any more of the Holy Spirit than someone who teaches, and so on and so on and such forth. And just, just so we're clear, he says, okay, that's the Holy Spirit. Uh, let's look at the Lord. Let's look at Christ, right? He says there are varieties of services, or if you would, ministries. But there's one Lord. There's one Jesus, right? So, some people are involved in women's ministry. Some people are involved in small group ministry. Some people are involved in the kids' ministry, in the greeting ministry, in the worship ministry. They're all different ministries, but what are they all doing? They're all serving the Lord. They should be, at least. There's only one Lord. There's only one Christ, but it may come out in different ways. And then he goes even broader. He says there's all kinds of services, or if you would, tasks that God has assigned. But there's only one God. There's only one Father. Are you following? Spirit, Son, the Father. But there's only one God. This is, he makes this point again in, in, uh, previously in chapter 3 when they're comparing. He says, you know, all these people are just instruments. It's only God who causes you to grow. Don't be confused by the person that God uses or the ministry that God uses or the gift that God uses. It was God who caused you to grow, not that thing. So you can actually go anywhere in the world and find a church. As long as they're following Christ and God is in that church, it doesn't matter if they raise their hands high or not. It doesn't matter whether or not the speaker, you know, can keep everything in a 15-minute TED Talk or not. It doesn't matter. Whatever it is that you love, God doesn't need that to grow you. Matter of fact, I think that's a sign of maturity. That you, that you don't need something that kind of, you know, tickles the other parts of your life. Not that those things are bad things. But when you, when you equate God must be moving because I feel a certain way, you're in trouble. You're in trouble. Basically, think of it this way. God calls you to something. Like for Paul, God called him to be an evangelist. In other words, to go out and tell people words. Peter, God called him to, to grow mature Christians. And, and in that calling, go out and, and bring new people to me, God called Paul to a ministry of evangelism. The evangelizer is telling them about Jesus. And, and in order to do that ministry of evangelism, the Holy Spirit gave him a gift, 
to fulfill the ministry, to fulfill God's call. It all leads back to him. It's about him and not us. Basically, the bottom line is we serve the same God. We serve the same God. That's why I'm all the time telling, you know, when I, we, we do this corny thing, right? When I say, hey, if you added up all the churches in the Bay Area, how many would you get? And you guys say, one. one. I know it's corny. But that's why we do that. Because there's, we need different churches to, to accomplish God's total work. We need churches to, to uh, reach uh, to... Um, to nationals from other countries. We need churches that, will, that, that are like attractive and do really fun stuff because people don't want to just come into a, a Bible teaching church sometimes because it's like, I don't understand. It seems weird to me. We also need Bible teaching churches that will take people who've responded to Christ and go a little deeper and then send them out to be light in the world. We need all those kinds of churches. And rather than saying my church is better than your church, my gift is better than your gift, my ministry is better than your ministry. And what does Paul say in 3, 1 about people with that attitude? You're immature. I wish I could give you the good stuff, but I can't. You're like a baby who needs milk. Meanwhile, I feel really mature because, you know, I got the right stuff. No, we serve the same God. It just comes out in different ways. And then he goes on in verse 7 to kind of delineate this. He says, to each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. Let me just kind of stop there real quick. The manifestation is basically, a, uh, it clearly shows that the, something is evident. In this case, it clearly shows that the Holy Spirit is in your life. That is part of the reason for this grace, what we call gifts, that come from the Spirit. It's evident that the Holy Spirit is working in your life. Now, this is really important. The proof isn't the thing itself. The proof is that there's something in your life that you're serving with. Think about that. So, so it, I mean, help. Miracles is a great one. Wisdom is an awesome one. Uh, speaking in a foreign language you don't know is a phenomenal one as well. As long as there's interpretation, people know what it is that you said. But the, but the, the major uh, thing that shows that the Holy Spirit isn't just the miraculous part of the gift. It's the fact that God's using you for something that's not about you. It's evident that the Holy Spirit is in your life. And, and, and notice, it tells us the reason. Why are you given this? For the common good. It doesn't, by the way, say, hey, you're given this, right? So everyone go, ooh, that was amazing. Because that's a lot of times how people speak about spiritual gifts. You need to have a spiritual gift so everyone goes, goes, wow. And by the way, sometimes that's the effect. There's nothing wrong with that. The, the uh, apostles sometimes healed people and people went, wow. Jesus healed people and people went, wow. But he also says at the end of John chapter 2 that after he did all those miracles and all the people believed that Jesus did not entrust himself to them. Why? Because he knew the hearts of men and women. He knew that they were not convinced by miracles because as soon as they got hard and life got real, they were gone. It didn't matter how powerful it was. So what's the gift given for? It says right there, the common good. It's given so that we may be built up. We may be encouraged so the church may grow. And I'm not talking about numerically. I'm talking about immaturity. The individual as well as the, it's for the good of the family. So my kids grow in that they, they learn how to, you know, in, in the beginning, right, we might have had them just take the broom after mom swept everything up and put it in a pile Hold, they would hold the dustpan. That was their, that was the, they could barely do that, right? Now, we've got beyond that. Now they clean, some better than others, the bathroom <laughs> or the kitchen themselves. It benefits them because they're learning how to contribute, but it also benefits the family. That's the desire. It's for the common good. Verse 8, to one is given through the Spirit, the utterance of wisdom, and to another, the utterance of knowledge. And these are pretty clear. You, you all know someone of wisdom. 
that you go to when you need advice, that when everybody else is kind of saying, I heard this, that, the other thing, this person, by the way, isn't speaking when the rest of us are. They're taking it all in. And then, then, then they say something, and you're like, oh, that's the good way to approach it, right? Any of you know Tom Green? He's a, he's a man who's gifted with wisdom. The knowledge is the person that just seems to be able, especially when it comes to the word of God, maintain that where everyone's kind of saying, what? And they're like, you know what? God says it this way, and then they, and then they go right to the scripture. It isn't their opinion? Isn't there someone? They, they say, no, somebody with knowledge encourages the body. And again, it comes according to the same Holy Spirit. In other words, wisdom and knowledge, there's no difference between them in terms of it, their source and their importance. To another, faith by the same Spirit. Now, this is, this is important. Faith, again, faith is that, is that ability to say, to understand that God is good despite the circumstances and to trust him that he's going to make, he's going to turn it out for your good. Now, here's another thing that you need to understand about the spiritual gifts. If it's not that only, if you have that gift, nobody else is supposed to do that. It's like, well, none of us are supposed to have faith because I don't have the spiritual gift of faith. No. When you have a spiritual, spiritual gift, it's an, it's an, if you would, a above and beyond, right? It's kind of like we, we have some drivers in our household. Some are better than others. Of course, the difference depends on who you ask. But it's clear that some are better than others. That doesn't mean I don't tell my kids, listen, you can't drive as well as me or your mom, so you can't drive. No. We drive really well, hopefully, as a good example to them in their driving and of course, in that case, they'll develop to be good drivers. We're all supposed to be people of faith. We're all supposed to do a lot of these things. Mercy is another gift. A helping is another gift, right? But people with this gift are the ones that when we're like, man, I want to have faith like, fill in the blank. I want, I want to have mercy like. If you, that person that you, that you said that about, they probably have the spiritual gift of mercy. They probably have the spiritual gift of faith. That doesn't mean we don't have it. It just means that, that God has, in order to encourage us for the common good, given them an extra special measure of it, because we need those folks to lead the way. One, uh, fair, uh, by the same Spirit, again, to the, another gifts of healing by the one Spirit. And that's, again, the ability just to kind of lay your hands on folks and see them heal. To another a working of miracles, so that's anything miraculous beyond healing. To another, prophecy. Sometimes it's foretelling the, uh, the future, but uh, sometimes it's uh, uniquely speaking in a situation, the very thing that God wants to say. To another, the ability to distinguish between spirits. And this is just to know, and this is really needed today, because there's a lot of talk out there in the name of Jesus and we need people to kind of listen to and go, that's not really of God. It sounds like it's of God, but it's not really of God. This one specifically comes between uh, prophecy and the gift of tongues because what we're going to find out later in chapter 14, when a prophet speaks, when someone with tongues speaks, there will be others with that gift that need to discern. Is that really from God or not? Is that really from God or not? That's distinguishing between the spirits, to another various kinds of tongues. Remember, I told you, every time you see tongues, languages. So speaking in an unknown language. And to another, the interpretation. So think of it, think of it this way, and I mentioned this last week, right? If I, if I have the gift of, of languages and I speak a language that nobody in this room knows, it does nothing good for the body of Christ. My gift exists to benefit you. But if I speak in an unknown language... It doesn't benefit you at all. So what he'll later say is, if you have that gift of languages, whether, again, be a human language or a heavenly language, it doesn't really matter. It doesn't benefit unless somebody else has a gift where God says this is what they just said. And then people can be encouraged. Everybody else can be encouraged. And that's, that's that last one, the gift of interpretation of languages or tongues. Verse 11, all these are empowered, this is the important part, by one and the same Spirit who apportions to each uh, one individual as he wills. In other words, don't get caught up in the gift you don't have. And don't be proud of the gift you have. 
One is not better than the other. The source of them is the Spirit of God, the mighty, powerful Spirit of God. And the power to enable someone to serve is just as mighty as the power to enable someone to teach, which is just as mighty as the power to enable someone to heal, and so on and so on and such forth. And it isn't by that individual's worth that they receive the gift. It's by God's wisdom. It's by God's power. It's by his plan that we receive that gift, which is why I got to be careful that I don't think somehow I got this gift, and so that makes me more than. No. By God's grace, he gave me a grace. He gave me a gift. And, and, and that is the point, you guys. The point is, when we empower our kids to be part of our family, it's a gift to them. Not only are they, are they hopefully using, because some kids like to do other things. Some kids like more to mow the lawn than, now granted, they'd rather just sit and do nothing, okay? So don't get this weird picture of my kids that it, it's not reality but some of them like to do other things more than uh, uh, more than and then they swap or they it's like I'd rather them do that and I'll do this kind of a thing my wife has figured that out for me right she doesn't ask me to do the dishes she'll say would you like to do the dishes or something I would hate worse (laughs) smart woman and so of course what I do I'll do the dishes Verse 12, for just, as the one body, uh, for just as the body is one and has many members, and all members of the body, though are many, are one body, so it is with Christ. Remember, and I just talked about, all, there's all these parts of the body, but there's one body. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, and there's religious or not religious originally, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. In other words, we're all, when we confess Christ, we were all baptized with the Holy Spirit. We were all filled with the Holy Spirit. We all received the, Holy, the same Holy Spirit. And he is the source. And this, this verse basically repeats to where he started, right? That the source is God. The source is Christ. The source is the Spirit. And that, and that he determines the divine purpose. We don't get to choose the gift. He chooses the gift, And so there's no room for jealousy or pride among believers regarding whatever gift or place that they that they play in the in the spiritual family. Now, to illustrate this point, we just went through several uh, examples, several gifts, if you would, graces that God gives. Okay, but it's important to note that this list is, never, is not consistent in Paul's writings. He's giving an example. So I put this in your notes, but it's also coming up on the screen. Later on in, in this chapter, he'll give another list. He'll talk about apostles, prophets, teachers, miracles, healing, helps, administration, tongues, and interpretation of tongues. Notice some repeat, but some don't. In his letter to the Ephesians, he'll talk about apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. That's it. In Romans 12, it talks about prophecy, service, teaching, encouraging, giving, leading, and mercy. That's it. So what is not common in all these passages is, all, is one list of gifts. And if you would think, if this is the exhaustive list, list of gifts, then it would be one list that he should, says everywhere. But it's not. You know what's consistent in all these uh, three passages? I don't expect you to answer that. It's rhetorical. (laughs) The image of the body. That's the one thing you find in every single passage. The point in every single passage is not, here's a list, figure it out. The point in every single body is, listen, you all are different, and that's a good thing. What's important is that you're one in Christ, that you're one body. It's, it's not, hey, figure out which, uh, which on this list you are. And it's not, here is the list. You can't have something else. Matter of fact, in other parts of scriptures, it talks about it. Uh, later on, in another place, it actually talks about some people are gifted with the gift of celibacy. Did you know singleness was a gift from the Lord? It's a grace from God? I know it doesn't feel that way sometimes. 
That's why, and by the way, some of these gifts, when you use them in the church, don't feel that way sometimes. But it is. It is. His, 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 his point is that we serve the same body. That's the major point. We all are not only brought into, adopted into God's family, but he then gives his family responsibility. It's a healthy family. And so as healthy members of God's family, he gives you a responsibility, sometimes more. You might have, you might have a, a two or three of these gifts that work together. You might have primarily one. It doesn't really matter. And you might not have one that's on the list. It doesn't matter. What does matter is this. When God called you in his family, he called you not only to be part of his family, him loving you, but to be part of the family, you contributing to the family, to your brothers and sisters that sit on your right and sit on your left. Did you know that one of the major indicators when someone who's raised in the church graduates high school and then goes on in life, one of the major indicators of whether or not they continue in their faith is not how much of the Bible they know. It's not how good their youth group was. It's not how large their church was. One of the major, major identifiers is were they involved in their church beyond going. In other words, did they see church as someplace where they had a place, or do they only see it as somewhere where they got something from it? Now, the number one thing is a vibrant personal relationship with Jesus. Okay? Nothing can, can take the place of that. But if you have a vibrant personal relationship with Jesus, guess what? You start contributing to the church of Jesus Christ. You start contributing to the body. When we make it our goal to be available to God and seek to serve others for Christ's sake, our spiritual graces, gifts, will come to the surface. We may need the insight of others to recognize our specific gifts. But we all have a place. Every single one of us has a place. And this is why I'm saying I, our prayer is not that you just attend Trinity Church, but that you become an advocate. There's a difference between saying this is the church I attend and this is my church. And there's a difference between saying, between saying this is my church and saying I do that. This works at our church because I'm involved here. So my challenge to you is to grow as a contributor to the family of God. Grow as a contributor to the family of God. Become part of, not only the family, but become part of a healthy part of the family, according to the word of God. Number one, ask God to increase your usefulness. And by the way, this is increase. Because in Romans chapter 12, it says, if you lead, Lead diligently. It says, if you give, give joyfully. In other words, whatever it is that you, you, if you've already kind of found your niche, get better at it. Get better at it. Aren't you, aren't you happy to know that I'm still trying to get to be a better teacher? I didn't just get my job and go, oh, I'm done. <laughs> Woo. No, I'm trying to grow. I'm, tr I'm trying to get better at the grace that God has given me. Seek opportunities of service. It, you cannot be a Christ follower and not spend less of your time on you and more of your time serving others, period. If you don't believe me, read the New Testament, come back, and let's talk about it. Or just read the Gospels. Just read Jesus. You, can, you cannot be a follower of Christ and not more and more stop thinking and doing things for you and start serving others. Seek opportunities of service. Observe how other believers serve. If you're kind of unsure, just kind of look around and say, you know what, I can do that. This person's kind of like me. I, I think I might be able to do something like that. Just, just observe the different opportunities. Don't get, don't, the list can be helpful if you look at some of the lists, but they also can be a hindrance if you're trying to put yourself in a box. For instance, you know that a lot of our folks that work with our kids don't have the gift of teaching. Some of them have the gift of mercy. And by the way, the kids are really happy about that. Some of them, so you know, you know that there, there are some people that the reason that they're really good with the kids, and I don't know if humor is a spiritual gift, but it's because it, it's a mixture of I care and I'm funny. 
And maybe they don't know the most of the Bible, but let me tell you, the kids want to show up because so-and-so cares about them and they make them laugh. And then when they talk about the Bible, they're engaged. So not every ministry is, is like, well, you, you can't do kids, you can't do youth, you can't do, because I don't have, the, I can't lead a small group because I don't have the gift of teaching. And it doesn't work necessarily that way. That gift helps, by the way. And by the way, I do believe that you can say God in his wisdom, say, God, you call me to lead second graders. You call me to lead this home group. Um, by the power of the Spirit, could you help me grow as a teacher? I think, I think in that way you can't ask for a gift because it's his to give, but he may say no. He might say, like he said to Paul, of course, this wasn't about a spiritual gift, but he might say, my grace is sufficient for you. I think you could lead that small group with just the gift of mercy. I, I, think, you could, I, I think you could do the second graders with just what I've given you, with compassion and humor. I can take care of the rest. Ask for spiritual strengths feedback from others. What, what do you say? We're, we are lousy when it, this comes to my li- our, our lives in this, in this manner. And one of, the, one of the hard things with the list is that is like uh, on the list, and one of the lists is administration, but, but we don't have a clear concept of that. We think, okay, in order to serve the church, I got I to gotta deal with people, right? And it's true that being part of a family, you have to deal with people, but some, of, some folks are not wired to deal a whole lot with people. And actually, that could be God's grace in your life, because when you're wired to do a whole lot with people, you're consumed by people and their time, and there's other things that need to get done. And so some folks who are consumed with people have a gift of administration. That doesn't mean they ignore people, because you can't administrate without working with people. But they get things done the rest of us don't, because they're wired a different way. Jim Panunzio, who we are reeling from right now, because the Lord has moved him to Oregon, had the gift of administration. And we are finding out... uh, for eight years, how much this church was kept going and blessed because Jim used his gift. And he didn't say, well, I I can't teach, so I guess I'll just show up on Sunday and listen. And then last, if if you, if that doesn't work for you, you're not kind of a hands-on person, you want a little bit more guidance, consider taking a class in spiritual gifting and service, which uh, starting October 28th on Sunday morning, Jim and Sue Thayer are going to be taking folks through. We'll take you through specifically kind of some exercises and giving feedback on the graces that God gives and where your place may be. We'll give you more specific details in the weeks to come, but that is on October 28th. It starts on Sunday. Grow as a contributor to the family of God. And not only will we benefit, but you will grow. You will grow. You know, that was the major theme when Christ prayed for us. When he was about to leave and he prayed for his disciples, he prayed, first of all, that we not be taken out of the, tr- out of the troubled world, but that he protect us. But then the, the biggest theme was unity. And that was the biggest problem in Corinth. Was, was they figured, they, they were always fighting about who the better teacher is. Uh, they, were, they, were, they were fighting over, you know, who had the better gift, they were, real, they were real proud of their spirituality. And Paul said, basically, you're showing your immaturity because real spirituality shows up in service and love for one another. Pray with me. Father God, thank you that the Holy Spirit resides in us. Would you stir in us, dear Lord, your love? And as we are overwhelmed by your love, may we just respond out of dear God, wanting to love you back. And Lord, we know that as we love you, part of the major thing you call us to do is to love each other. And so would you show us how to do that? Would you show us more and more how to lean in, serve one another for the common good? And for those out there, dear Father, who, who, who have a decent grasp on um, the grace that you've given them, the, the place that they are, are supposed to do their ministry and, and the gifts as such, would you help them grow in that, that they may get better at that, dear Lord, that they may empower others and train others to have that gift, dear God. Lord, for those who have a, have a hunger to kind of find out, would you help them discern, dear Lord, what is that ministry? What is that gift, dear Lord? May they open up their ears to kind of hear others speak in their life and say, man, this is really how you minister to me. And may you just show them specifically where they can step in 
and begin to serve in that way, dear Father. And, and for folks, dear God, that have been long content receiving, and I know there's a season, like, like children, dear Father, where the most important thing for you to do is to receive. I pray, dear Father, that um, um, they may understand that no matter where they're at, it is time, part of growing, is to begin to do something by the power of the Holy Spirit, supernaturally, dear Father, um, something for the common good, whether they're great at it or not. Would you communicate that and give them the courage to follow you in that? Lord, may we become a better, healthier family as the Holy Spirit stirs in us each a grace. May we use it to the best of our ability that folks aren't attracted because we have supernatural power, but that there's a body of people who supernaturally submit themselves to one another, encourage one another, and take care of each other, and grow in their love and trust of Jesus Christ. We pray this in his name. Amen. Amen. If you stand up, I'd like to ask God's blessing as you go out from this place. Thank you all uh, very much for being here. Uh, God, I just ask that you bless each one here, um, that your spirit may stir in them, communicate to our hearts, dear Father, where you have us serve. And just, Lord, give us the faith and the grace to step out, um, less of us, more of you, and experience the joy of contributing to your family. We praise in Jesus' name, amen. amen. God bless. We'll see you all next week.